50 cent. Robert Green, the 50th law. Not Hill, Timendum Ist, Fear Nothing. Be Fearless. Understand, momentum, page 107. Understand, momentum in life comes from increased fluidity. A, willing, a willingness to try more, to move in a less constricted fashion. On many levels, it remains something hard to put into words, but by understanding the process, becoming more conscious of the elements involved, you can place your mind in a ready position. Better able to exploit any positive movement in your life. Call this calculated momentum. For this purpose, you must practice and master the following four types of flow. Number one, mental flow. In the time of Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's youth, mid-15th century, knowledge had hardened into rigid compartments. In one slot, there was philosophy and scholasticism. scholasticism. In another, the arts, which were considered uh, more like simple crafts. In another, science, which was not yet very empirical. On the margin stood all forms of dark knowledge. The arts of the occult. Da Vinci was the illegitimate son of a notary, and because of this murky social position, he was denied the usual formal education, all of which became a great blessing in disguise. His mind was freed from all the prejudices and the rigid categories of thinking that prevailed at the time. He went to serve an apprenticeship in the studio of the great artist Veraccio, and once he began to learn their, the craft of drawing and painting, a process was set in motion that led to the forming of one of the most original minds in the history of mankind. Leonardo da Vinci when he was in an apprenticeship in the studio of the great artist Veraccio. Veraccio. Knowledge in one field simply opened up in Da Vinci an insatiable hunger to learn something else in a related field. The study of painting led to that of design in general which led to an, entrance, an interest in architecture. From there he flowed to study in engineering, making war machines and strategy, observing animals and the mechanics of motion that could be applied to technology. Studying birds and aerodynamics, the anatomy of humans and animals, the relationship between emotions and physiology, and on and on. This incredible stream of ideas even overflowed in areas of the occult. His mind would recognize no boundaries. He sought the connections between all natural phenomena. In this sense, he was ahead of his time and the first real Renaissance man. His discovery in various fields had a momentum, the intensity of one leading to another. Many could not understand him and thought he was eccentric, even erratic. But great patrons such as King France, Francois, Francis, one of France, and even Caesar Borgia recognizes Caesar, 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 Caesar Borgia, C. Bor Borgia, <laughs> recognize his genius and sought to exploit it. Today we have regressed to a point that resembles the pre-Renaissance. Knowledge has once again hardened into rigid categories with intellectual shutoff in various ghettos. Intelligent people are considered serious by virtue of how deeply they immerse themselves in one field of study, their viewpoint becoming more and more myopic. Someone who crosses these rigid demarcations is inevitable, inevitably considered a dil dilettante. dilettante. After college, we're all encouraged to specialize to learn one thing well and to stick with it. We end up sh uh, strangling ourselves in the narrowness of our interest. With all these restrictions, knowledge has no flow to it. Life does not have, uh, have these categories. They are mere conventions that we mindlessly abide by. Da Vinci remains the icon and the inspiration for a new form of knowledge. In this form, what matters are the connections between things and not what separates them. The mind has a particular momentum in itself. When it heats up and discovers something new, it tends to find other items to study and illuminate. All the greatest in innovations in history come from an openness to discovery, one idea leading to another, sometimes coming from unrelated fields. You must develop this spirit and the same insatiable hunger for knowledge. This comes from widening your fields of study and observation, letting yourself be carried along by what you discover. You will find that you will come up with unexpected ideas, the kind that will lead to new practices or novel opportunities. If things run dry in your particular particular line of work you can have developed your mind along other lines that you can now exploit 
Having such mental flow will allow you to constantly think around any obstacle and maintain your career momentum. Emotional flow. By nature, we are emotional creatures. It is how we primarily react to events. Only afterwards are we able to see that such emotional responses can be destructive and need to be reined in. You cannot repress this part of human nature, nor should you ever try. It is like a flood that will overwhelm you all the more for your attempts to dam it up. What you want is for these endless emotions that assail you during the day to wash over you, to never hold on to one single emotion for very long. You're able to let go of any kind of obsessive feeling. If someone says something that bothers you, find a way to move quickly past the feeling, either to excuse what they said, to make it less important, or to forget. Forgetting is a skill that you must develop in order to have emotional flow. If you cannot help but feel anger or disgust in the moment, make it a point to not let it remain the following day. When you hold on to emotions like that, it is as if you put blinders on your eyes. For that amount of time, you see and feel only what this emotion dictates, falling behind events. Your mind stops on feeling of feelings of failure, disappointment, and mistrust, giving you that awkwardness of someone out of tune with the moment. Without realizing it, all of your strategies become infected by these feelings, pushing you off course. To combat this, you must learn the art of counterbalance. When you are fearful, force yourself to act in a bolder fashion than usual. When you feel inordinate hate, find some object, object of love or admiration that you can focus on with intensity. One strong emotion tends to cancel out the other and help you move past it. One might seem, It might seem that intense feelings of love, hate, hate or anger can be used to impel you forward on some project, but that is an illusion. Such emotions give you a burst of energy that falls quickly and leaves you as low as you were high. Rather, you want a more balanced emotional life with fewer highs and lows. This not only helps you keep moving and overcoming petty obstacles, but it also affects people's perceptions of you. They come to see you as someone who has grace under pressure, a steady hand. And they will turn to you as a leader. Maintaining such steadiness will keep that positive flow in motion. Social flow. Working with people on any level can be a disorderly affair. They bring their differences and own energy to the project as well as their own agendas. The natural tendency for a leader to try to tamp down these differences and get everyone on the same page. It's a natural tendency. This seems like the strong thing to do, but in fact it stems from that infantile fear of the unpredictable. And in the end it becomes counterproductive as those who work for you bring less and less energy to the task. After an initial burst of enthusiasm in your venture, the discontent of those working for you can quickly stifle any momentum you had developed. Early in his career, the great Swedish director Igmar Bergman used this more tyrannical approach in dealing with his actors, but he began to be dissatisfied with its results and so decided to experiment with something different. He would sketch out the script for a film, leaving the dialogue mostly open. He would then invite his actors to bring his, their own energy and experiences into the mix, shaping the dialogue to fit their emotional responses. This would make the screenplay come alive from within, and sometimes it would require rewriting parts of the plot. In working with the actors on this level, Bergman would enter their spirit, mirroring their energy as a way to get them to relax and open up. He allowed for this more and more as his career evolved, and the results were astonishing. The actors came to love this, feeling more involved and engaged. They wanted to work with him, and their enthusiasm carried over onto their performances, each one better than the last. His films had the feel of something much more lifelike and engaging than those structured around some rigid script. His work became increasingly popular as he went further with this collaborative process. This should be your model in any venture that involves groups of people. You provide the framework based on your knowledge and expertise, but allow room for this project to be shaped by those involved in it. They are motivated and creative, helping to give the project more flow and force. You're not going too far in this process. You set the overall direction and tone. You are simply letting go of that fearful need to make people do exactly as you desire. In the long run, you will find that your ability to gently divert people's energy in your direction gives you a wider range of control over the shape and result of the project. Cultural Flow In the 1940s, the great saxophone player Charlie Parker single-handedly revolutionized the world of jazz with his invention of the style known as bebop. But he watched it soon become the convention in jazz, and within a few years, he was no longer the revolutionary figure worshipped by hipsters. Younger artists emerged who took his inventions to other levels. 
This was immensely disturbing to him, and he spiraled downward, downward, dying at an early age. The trumpeter, Miles Davis, had been a part of Parker's ensemble, and he personally witnessed this decline. Davis understood the situation at its core. Jazz was an incredibly fluid form of music that underwent tremendous changes in style in short periods of time. Because America did not honor or take care of its black musicians, the women who found themselves surpassed by a new trend had to suffer a terrible fate like Parker. Davis vowed to overcome this dynamic. His solution was to never settle on one style. Every four years or so, he would radically reinvent his sound. His audiences would have to catch up with the changes, and most often they did. It, so it soon became a self-fulfilling prophecy, as he was seen as someone who had his finger on the latest trend, and his new sound would be studied and emulated. As part of this strategy, he would always hire the youngest generation of performers to work with him, harnessing the creativity that comes with youth. In this way, he developed a kind of steady momentum that carried him past the usual decline in a jazz musician's career. He kept this inventiveness up for over 30 years, something unheard of in that genre. Understand, you exist in a particular cultural moment with its own flow and style. When you are young, you are more sensitive to these fluctuations in taste, and so you generally keep up with the present. But as you get older, the tendency for you to become locked in a style that is dead one that you associate with your youth and its excitement. If enough time passes, your style lock can become quite ludicrous. You look like a museum piece. Your momentum will grind to a halt as people come to categorize you in a narrow period of time. Instead, you must find a way to periodically reinvent yourself. You're not trying to mimic the latest trend. That will make you look equally ludicrous. You are simply rediscovering that youthful attentiveness to what is happening around you, incorporating what you like into a newer spirit. You're taking pleasure in shaping your personality, wearing a new mask. The only thing you really have to fear is becoming a social and cultural relic. Reversal of Perspective In Western culture, we tend to associate strength of character with consistency. People who shift around too much with their ideas and image can be judged as untrustworthy and even demonic. We honor those who are true to the past and certain timeless values. On the other hand, people who challenge and change the prevailing conventions are often viewed as destructive figures, at least while they are alive. The great Florentine writer Niccolo Machiavelli saw these values of consistency and order as products of a fearful culture and something that should be reversed. In his view is precisely our fixed nature, a tendency to hold to one line of action or thought. That is the source of human misery and incompetence. A leader can come to power through acts of boldness, but when the times shift and require something more cautious, he generally will continue with his bold approach. He is not strong enough to adapt. He is a prisoner of his fixed nature. What raised him above others then becomes the source of his downfall. True figures of power, as Machiavelli saw it, would be people who could shape their own character, call up the qualities that were necessary for the moment, and know how to bend the circumstance. Those who remain true to the to some idea or value without self-examination often prove to be the worst tyrants in life. They make others conform to dead concepts, and their negative forces holding back the change that's necessary for any culture to evolve and prosper. This is how you must operate. You actively work to overcome this fixed nature, deliberately trying a different approach and style than your usual one to get a sense of a different possibility. You come to view periods of stability and order with mistrust. Something isn't moving in your life and in your mind. On the other hand, moments of change and apparent chaos are what you thrive on. They make your mind and spirit jump to life. If you reach such a point, you have tremendous power. You have nothing to fear from moments of transition. You welcome, even create them. Whenever you feel rooted and established in place, that is when you should be truly afraid. People wish to be settled only as far as they are unsettled. Is there any hope for them? Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, yeah, so 50th Law by 50 Cent. Um, talking about how we need to have a flow, uh, our uh, different flows in life, our emotions. We don't need to have highs and lows. Uh, reversal perspective, he's talking about how we, um, if we're in a comfortable place, we don't want to stay in a comfortable place because uh, being comfortable means we're static, we're not moving, we're not changing, we're not thinking. Uh, uh, but when we see chaos and we see movement and we see change and we see activity, that's when uh, uh, we should thrive. So it's when we become um, um, safe and cautious. That's when we need to be concerned the most. So.
Occupy. Viva la Revolution, Louisville.